Geo Spatial Working Group has been in existence for, oh, I guess maybe 20 years or so. And um, just a brief overview of the node set and, and, our, and our goals that we have. So um, X3D, as we said before, declarative 3D graphics. And, and the goal of our geospatial working group is to make it simple to bring in 3D, um, uh, 3D geographic data into the, into the open and extensible X3D standard. And in the geospatial world, um, people need to deal with all kinds of different coordinates, but most of the time it boils down to a latitude, longitude, elevation, but then there's different coordinate systems. There's Cartesian, Earth-centric coordinate system. And then in the computer graphics world, there's the local X3D coordinate system, which is this arbitrary, unitless um, X3D space. So what the geospatial component does is, is try to simplify dealing with conversions between these three spaces, three uh, coordinate systems. Um, brief graphic here showing those coordinate systems. I won't dwell on that, but there's a lot of um, um, strong mathematics behind this, these conversions. And, and just some more influence, uh, you know, some issues that crop up, for instance, navigation and the concept of what is up in a scene and being able to deal with that and, and having an understanding of, say, the the surface of an ellipsoid so that as, as you navigate around the globe, up makes sense in a fly issue. So those sorts of issues are dealt with in the geospatial component at, at a fundamental level in X3D so that it makes it easier for the uh, content developer to generate content. So in summary, the geospatial component handles all the transformations and precision calculations needed to work with geographic data. I encourage people to join our community. Um, I guess that, that top bullet there of our booth number doesn't apply now, but we do have a geospatial mailing list. It is closed to members. Uh, it's because we have um, a strong liaison relationship with the Open Geospatial Consortium. And, and to respect that, we, um, we, we limit the geospatial list to members. Um, there's been, um, uh, you know, there's open source projects to commit to. And as I mentioned in my use case uh, study, there's, there's some growing interest in extending um, the, the uh, component to, to, to tackle uh, some interesting, ish, in, interesting challenges like, like large um, tile set data and things like that. So encourage people to come in and, and join our community. Thank you. And who's up next, Anita? That would be me, I think. Okay, Mike Erato. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I'm uh, Mike number three uh, in the consortium. Uh, let me bring up my screen here. Can everyone see that, hopefully? Yes, thanks. Great. So, uh, hi, I'm Mike Erato. I said Mike number three in the consortium. Um, and um, I'm going to tell you, I'm a co-chair of the medical working group with our illustrious president, Nick Paulus. And I'm going to just give you a quick overview of some of the uh, activities that are going on in the medical working group. Okay. So um, these are related activities. We have some of our fingers in some of these uh, more than others. So I'm just going to give you a great over, uh, uh, overview so you have an idea of our activities. Uh, first one, Near for, for All, um, and, and that's a website I'll talk to you about. You've already heard about the NIH th uh, 3D Print Exchange, but I just wanted to give you an, another perspective, specifically for the medical working group on something on that. Visualization of data through FHIR, which is a, a data interchange protocol. Uh, CPET visualization, and that's uh, physiologic data visualization, and the Zebrafish, Zebrafish, blah, Zebrafish Brain Browser. And the ones in STARS uh, limit uh, um, or actually leverage work that we've done on the volume rendering component of X3D, uh, which the medical working group did um, author in, um, with some grant funding um, in the past uh, from the, um, the Department of um, the Army Material Command. Uh, and now that's being uh, constantly improved. 
So the Mirror for All website uh, is a really cool website that you can go to. The link is below in red. And um, it's a, a browser-based volume rendering. Um, it's, uh, you can upload uh, any CT or MRI scans that you might have, which are in DICOM format. Um, the, um, as I said, it works in the browser and it's completely processed locally. So that preserves your privacy so you can uh, feel free to use any images and they're not going to the cloud at all. Um, there's no cloud-based rendering. This is all done on your machine. So then uh, performance may vary based on your CPU and GPU combination. But this is a great way for uh, to, to democratize um, uh, for patients and also for providers to look at uh, uh, the DICOM images as processed in a volume-based format. Um, the NID, NIH 3D Print Exchange, you've already heard of from uh, Daryl and Megan, uh, which has been fantastic work. Um, they've done a critical um, you know, service during our, our, the pandemic for both um, you know, molecular uh, views of COVID and also for creating uh, personal protective equipment, which is in short supply many, many of the times, especially in the surge areas. Uh, but when, another thing, and I have in the middle there, there's a picture of a heart um, and that's, um, uh, it's critical sometimes for um, providers, especially when they're doing surgeons doing complex uh, surgical cases, for example, uh, with pediatric um, uh, cardiac anomalies, uh, to be able to understand what that anomaly is so they can sort of pre-plan before they, they do a surgery. And the NIH 3D Print Exchange has, has done a critical um, service in allowing uh, people to upload uh, different types of images that could be printed uh, and then used, uh, for example, prior to a surgery so they can uh, have planning that, that actually increases, you know, that, that improves the outcome because they understand um, sort of the 3D aspects and the orientations and the relationships between these complex anomalies. Um, Visualization of healthcare through FIRE. FIRE is fast healthcare inter interoperability resources. It's, uh, it's the newest um, health level seven um, protocol for data interchange between, uh, for health data. It's extremely important. HL7 is used throughout all healthcare organizations to, uh, to exchange data, not only to exchange data uh, between themselves uh, within their own systems, but also uh, with between systems. It's critical to use um, HL7 protocols to, for example, between lab companies and bring them to your uh, primary care provider or to your, their hospital. Um, it's eight, but this new FHIR, it's only been around five years or so, but it's, fat, it's quickly taking, um, um, you know, adoption uh, and uh, what's great is it's HTTP based, it's resource oriented RESTful API using XML and JSON. And um, this link here shows um, what uh, uh, Nick Paulus's and his uh, students did um, using FHIR to pull from a database and to visualize data. And I think you're gonna see a lot more of that and that's been mentioned before by Anita that data visualization is really important and as we get more and more healthcare data, and it's all digitized now. You know, how to make sense of that um, becomes really important, and 3D visualization is key. Um, another um, project uh, in the medical working group is involved with, um, with other um, academic organizations is looking at cardiopulmonary exercise testing visualization. Right now, this is done uh, you looking at numerous tables and graphs, and this is looking at different physiologic parameters uh, uh, for people, whether they're athletes or whether they're people who have uh, lung disease or people who have had heart attacks before and, and trying to understand how their physiology works. But combining these together, um, 3D can show a lot more insights. And you can see a screenshot there using X3D and combining these, um, th this data to get uh, to make it sort of more understandable and actually much quicker to to sort of visualize in your head and and make sense of it. And then finally, the uh, Zebrafish Brain Browser, which also is through Virginia Tech, uh, using the volume rendering component of uh, 
of um, X3D, which was helped develop by the medical working group. And this is just an example, a specific example of using volume rendering for um, visualizing you know, an animal. And also it's, it's, it's uh, sort of a mixed mode, it has both 2D and 3D aspects. And you can cut it and look at it in the lower right hand corner there has a, a volume rendered uh, image of the zebrafish. And there's the link there. So that's my presentation very quickly. And uh, any questions, you can put them in the, the um, chat box. And I'm going to hand it over to Vince, Vince Marchetti, who's going to talk about the DPS uh, working group activities. Thanks. OK, thanks, Mike. Mike number three. Mm -hmm. I'm going to briefly talk about the, uh, the work of the uh, design, printing, and scanning working group. Uh, first of all, let me let me confirm that I've I am sharing my screen. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to really concentrate on one bit of work. So, whoops. The bit of of work that our members have been working on in the, in the past few months. Uh, really illustrates uh, X3D working with other standards and X3D working in kind of an open source style of development. So I'm going to talk about a project that involved using X3D to visualize CAD files that are contained in using the ISO STEP format. So STEP is an ISO international standard for computer-aided design files. It includes as well uh, computer-aided manufacturing, computer-aided engineering, that is anal engineering analysis, and is closely related to standards in buildings information management and in plant, uh, industrial plant, chemical plant preparation. So it really has wide application. And what we've talked to, what we've been working on, and I'll go to a live demonstration in a moment is, uh, having X3D work with several other open source and open standards, in particularly a software package called Open Cascade, which is an open source, at least it's available in a community edition open source version. Open Cascade is a, it's called a geometry kernel. It's a set of C++ libraries for working with CAD data. Uh, Similarly, we work with uh, Python, which is uh, very, becoming a very popular scripting language for uh, making different software packages work together. And finally, a, uh, a way of a development environment called notebooks, and particularly Jupyter notebooks. Now, Jupyter is spelled J-U-P-Y-T-E-R to reflect its Python heritage. This is becoming an increasingly popular way of for engineers and scientists to present data analysis and data visualizations. Immediately jump to uh, the live demonstration. This is, I, as I say, the, a lot of people worked on this, but this particular notebook was prepared by one of our members, Dr. Andreas Plesch, who's done a lot of work in, in making X3D work with Python and Open Cascade. And the point is, make a long story short is uh, what you see in the visualization is a visualization of a it's called an impeller, it's a little fan blade basically. Um, its geometry is defined in a step file. So out somebody designed this fan, uh, prepared this step file, which is a standard output. And then uh, Dr. Plesch, Andreas Plesch prepared a Jupyter notebook in which he was able to read this step file and render it. And the rendering is done using X3D and X3DOM. I, if there are Python programmers uh, in the audience, I will show that the notebook is based on some fairly simple Python code, which is importing the file, uh, setting up the, the uh, conversion to X3D. Uh, for this particular notebook, uh, Andreas demonstrated using two different techniques in Open Cascade through the Vermal and through an X3D, 
detail we can talk about in Q&A perhaps. Uh, but again, the takeaway is that this makes this kind of visualization of a CAD file available to a much larger audience. I mean, larger is a relative term, but the, the, that group of technologists who are interested and familiar with Jupyter Notebooks you don't need to do a lot of the programming and deployment in particular is taken care uh, of for you by this notebook environment. I'll jump back again in the interest of time. I'll quickly talk about some of our other uh, things we're working on, working closely with NIST or collaborating with NIST, working with NIST or uh, on, on their efforts in Again, visualizing engineering CAD data encapsulated in, in step files. Whoops. And uh, I, finally, uh, we've had some interest in using uh, extra to visualize digital twins. So thank you for your interest. And I will turn things over to Dr. Feng Lu to talk about our user experience working group. Thank you, Vince. Let me turn on my video and it was told my video cannot be turned on. I'll go ahead to, all right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So let me show as the slides show. So we are the newest group in the Web3D consortium. Um, we just got approved in March. So our goal as simple as this cup of coffee. We want our 3D application experience, user experience as handy, easy, and enjoyable and intuitive as just drinking a cup of coffee. So um, as the pandemic, as we can see, um, we've been hit so hard and we all lock inside a room. And this is a great opportunity for us for 3D um, e-commerce and 3D application being used. Um, people are looking for it, but how we can make them as easy as possible so people can, can use them widely. So the mission of the UX group um, is establish that you know, we want to collect the best practice and see what the standardized capability can support um, easy reach user experience and navigation need to be very intuitive and the interaction need to be um, effective for all kinds of 3D application on the web or on the mobile device. So I'm going to skip all those details, but I um, want to quickly talk about the outcome for our group. We want to establish the standardized measurement for user experience on 3D interactive applications and defining the minimum side of the interactive capacity, um, cap capability within the interaction, um, interactive application. Because, you know, as a usability study, uh, a lot of time is, uh, is a goal base. It depends on what user want to do. So we will um, trying to give an overall minimum set of uh, um, um, cap um, capabilities, um, but we cannot go a lot of details. Probably, um, we trying to embed those into the new version of X three D release and identify some best applications that we need your help. And that's what one of the reasons we're here today to call participants and call the collection of your knowledge and to improve the user experience. Um, you know, tons of functions, you may have a lot of functions and most of the times we are looking at how cool our application is. And, but if the interface is blocking user from using those wonderful functions, then it will be um, not going to be useful. Um, so we're trying to provide procedures and tools for usability study for 3D environment on multi-platform 
um, include web applications and AR, VR, and mobile applications, um, trying to promote responsive 3D environment across different platform, uh, evaluate accessibility, Web 3D, of course, and also on the web, uh, and also the uh, mo mobile applications. So the current work in progress, I um, want to report to everybody, we have been meeting um, every two weeks. Um, so the group is uh, trying to design principles for 3D applications and moving toward to navigations, how we really want to um, our application user to be able to navigate with that flip over suddenly. For example, we're thinking about adding the helicopters uh, mode into the, uh, the standard possible. And so we can restrain the motion is um, not going to um, having something like flip over happens when people don't want that. So, um, and also how to uh, navigate the, um, the scene, for example, a person want to, well, the kids cannot go to the zoo or the aquarium or the museum now. And the 3D virtual scene is one of the thing. And when they get on the 3D scene, and just like we are in the real time, real world, are we giving them uh, like direction for um, where to go or just start with get them to walk around and look? So in the real scene, we probably want to give them kind of a different, different hallway. To, the, here is go to the um, um, animals from, um, African animals from east to west or whatever, you know, give the different directions. Here is the same thing in the 3D world. We want to simulate the same in the real world. So we could give some viewpoints so they can jump directly to their goal. Um, so you, you all have been using that. So is that on the interface? Um, so we're gonna work on the more than um, navigation, we want to work on how to seamlessly transition from the navigation to a selection, selection object selection and um, manipulation system control um, mode and um, also assess the you know, current uh, best practice and you maybe later use a consistent data logging and usability for usability study. I'm so glad to see so many data driven the AI possibility um, in your example early uh, for, uh, for early presentations. So this is a, one of the examples um, from X, um, X3DOM. Um, they have a, um, a little navigations or um, um, an interface to show user what mode you're in, which um, key you can go to different mode, which will give the user probably settle the, the learning curve. So uh, that's just a quick example. We're really um, just started. So we're calling participants no matter what platform you're using uh, your develop your application on, and we're calling the best practice and even you don't think it's best of practice, it could be uh, some of the feature you have. So please uh, send us what you, you, you have working on. Um, and we would like to you to participate if you're doing research or development in the um, UX, HCI, uh, UI field, or even you're just a user. And we want you to be part of this testing process as well. So we're trying to, um, collecting all the research and the inventory right now and see if we can possibly have a session on the particular for user experience in the coming annual um, conference. And here is our um, co-chair, um, Nicholas and um, uh, Amila and I is our co-chair of the UX group. So please contact us if you get any questions, and this is a communication uh, from the website. Uh, I already uploaded the slides, so you all can click and go in. We meet every other week on Wednesday. Um, so if you all can join us, it would be great. We were looking forward to, to more people to contribute to this area. And I think it's a very important area.
Well, this is the end of my presentation. Um, I think that our next presenter is Nicholas. She's going to talk about the Heritage Working Group. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Um, it's it's very exciting uh, to see all of the activities uh, in our in our organization. I'm going to just give a quick uh, update about our heritage group. Of course, heritage, uh, we chose that name because it includes both cultural heritage and natural heritage. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been working with other members in the community. You may remember um, a workshop in LA, la the last conference, um, con connecting basically the communities of the digital library and museums to the community of technologists and 3D uh, practitioners. So I think I've got a, a live feed here. I'm gonna quick kind of share uh, a screen to kind of give you guys a sense of the sorts of things that we're working on. Uh, we just recently got a large grant to digitize uh, our insect collection at Virginia Tech. And so this brings up a whole host of very real issues, um, okay, which is about the metadata and how does this travel with the file? Uh, what are the different kinds of data structures that we need to be able to support um, the metadata? And then, of course, uh, things like resolution. Um, these are all basically photogrammetrically uh, acquired uh, bugs, and we're uh, going through several hundred of these, uh, and that really gives us a chance to test the X3D standard at scale when we're making uh, collections like this. So we're going from a pile of images, I think it says uh, here, there's 390 pictures of this bug on a pen from different angles. We reconstruct the 3D model and publish it with, with X3D. So we're really looking forward to seeing how different communities, uh, including our colleagues at the Smithsonian, are defining these kinds of metadata schemes. And uh, of course, uh, we'll be putting those to the test uh, over the next year in the working group and, and at Virginia Tech. So I hope you'll join us and uh, look at how we can make more uh, interactive and rich uh, collections using X3D. Thanks. Okay, so I think we've got uh, one of the things that's been very interesting with the Heritage Group, of course, is how we're able to start to annotate and tag uh, different kinds of items in our collection. And that kind of brings us to the Semantic Working Group and some of their efforts. Um, I believe we have uh, perhaps uh, John Brutzman or Jakob Flutinski to uh, introduce the group. Yes, thank you, Nicholas. Don here. Uh, okay. We actually do have Jakob uh, virtually. Let's see if his video works. And I will attempt to share the screen. This video will be online, so we'll let it go for a little bit, and then uh, I'll tell you a little more. So we're seeing Jakob, but we're not here. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, we should have uh, tested that. But uh, Jakob is, let's uh, switch screens here. Um, are we seeing that? Yes, we're back to your slides. Okay, very good. Thanks. 
So Jakob's describing uh, the wonders of Semantic Web Working Group. And um, please, please look at this video and check out these slides too, because we're giving you more detail than can fit in most brains in a hurry. It certainly took me a while. But Jakob is, uh, he's written a series of brilliant papers in the Web3D conferences. And we've together crafted, how do we build an ontology? Uh, which means how do we unlock X3D models as if they were machine readable data, not just by renderers, but by reasoners and querying tools. So I'm gonna uh, swoop through the slides here. Here's a really interesting uh, notion is that when you make your data accessible to semantic web, you can start writing queries. And if you wonder what a query is like, well, any, anytime you type into your search bar or talk into your phone and say, hey, tell me about, that's a query. And it's matching terms to metadata and doing mashups and subsequent relationships and relationships and relationships. So we're unlocking all of this. A really good slogan uh, from uh, Jim Hendler, one of the uh, originators of Semantic Web is the answer to your question is the response to the query, meaning if you didn't ask it right, you don't, you don't get an answer. And better yet, if you didn't pose it right in your models, you can't get an answer. So we're pressing on through this, and we have some good initial results. Again, much of the detail is on the inside and, and bears a little scrutiny, but you have uh, um, a different way of looking at your 3D models that is optimized for search. It is optimized for asking questions that are highly structured. And what we did was we worked very incrementally over the last year and a half. The assets are all online. We didn't try to invent all this stuff manually. Rather, we built some examples and then we automated it. We automated the production of both the relationships in X3D and the ways to query them, the conversion. So uh, the slides show how we've put together lots of tools. We started with our XML scheme, which already does a pretty high job of, of qualifying your content, making sure it's valid. And then we uh, decorated it, added information so it's repeatable in other languages, including this one, worked on converters, and uh, the power of this is that we can change everything. We can match X3D4 exactly. We can go through and put it in reasoning tools. Uh, I don't know about you, but 3,711 axioms, that's a lot. It adds up. The stepping ahead, all of these examples are online, not just the turtle, but also example queries to show that it works. So we're using two tools primarily, Protege and uh, Apache Gina, the ARQ tool. This gives you a, a slice of what does your model look like in OWL. Turtle OWL triples are powerful because they can relate to anything, databases, uh, JSON, XML, so on and so forth. Here's a query. Example, this is just saying, hey, you got a title in there, and it looks at the world info, and if it finds it, it reports it. So that's our baseline query, our hello turtle query for the entire scene, but we've gone farther than that. Right now, we're uh, working, and we, we're able to reach into a scene and say, hey, are your validation chains well-formed? Do, you, do your routes all connect to something? Can you go from start to finish? Do you match the types? you match the access type, so it goes into us and goes out us. That is something that most validators can't do. That is something that many X3D tools can't even tackle. They just say, well, it works or it doesn't. It's only human discernible. So we're dealing with that. It's making great progress. We think the next steps are how do we integrate metadata models from many different things, cultural heritage, CAD, Medical, how do we use the structured vote to perform direct queries? We've also see a path ahead to, well, gee, if we can convert other 3D formats, maybe we can reason across them too. So uh, I'm very 
proud to be working with Jakob in these references and uh, striving towards general 3D query. Okay, um, I think I should proceed straight ahead then with the next uh, group summary, and that's uh, humanoid animation. And uh, thank you, William Glasgow, if you're still with us for providing these slides. Uh, lots of stuff, lots of stuff. We shipped to version two, you may have noticed. What version two gives us is full anatomical correctness for every bone in the human body. Don't have to use that. Humanoids or anything you want, could be a cartoon character, but you can use full rigor. And we've not only got every single bone and joint and the corresponding skin constructs, but we have four levels of articulation, which allow you to subdivide and just use the parts you want. So if you don't need to go all the way down to every joint in the hand and foot, okay, don't. But we've got a huge number of legacy models that are online. We're slowly rolling through each and every one. And we're perfecting our validation tools that are checking to see, do you have the right name? Is it in the right order? Is it in the right version? Does it match an alias to a different anatomical model? Really interesting stuff. Uh, the other major thing, I don't have a demo today. You'll see them emerging motion animation. We can import motion capture from BVH. We can adapt other things. Uh, we're trying to just unlock the human body in X3D in a formal, rigorous way so that even our medical group might consider it. Okay, um, just in case anybody's not overwhelmed yet, uh, we also have a slide set on uh, X3D version 4. Um, really thrilled to announce, let's get, the, let's get the right link here, on Saturday, after many years of work, but matching uh, our release a year ago, uh, Web3D Consortium has released uh, X3D4 public draft, and it's quite thorough. There's a lot to it. Here's what it looks like online if you go there. This has all been available to all Web3D members all along, but you can see we've put changes across the whole spec some of them quite major. And so let's look from the top down now of what, the, what some of these capabilities are. And um, uh, here's a summary. There's a lot there. This is not some kind of sudden afterthought. This has taken years, years of effort. And because everybody cares about X3D who uses it and everybody has a lot of features and, how do we get it all together? Well, I think we're at the threshold now. We are implementing, we're evaluating examples. We're seeing, is it ready for prime time? Getting close, we have a lot of stuff. Here are some of the highlights summarized for you. Uh, the HTML5 integration. We have two very prominent, uh, very excellent implementations. One's X3DOM, you've seen multiple examples of that today. The other's called Excite, also open source, also JavaScript, also in our examples uh, for every single scene. That's the inset you see, because it's uh, so capable. We've ported to multiple languages, multiple file formats, yet kept X3D as the center of each of these things. Okay, that's pretty good, what else? Well, GLTF, we have pushed hardest on this Thanks to Michaelis Camborellis, we have in the Castle Game Engine and in the specification, we have full up capabilities for GLTF model loading, the corresponding lighting, and authors can use new high-end lighting or classical lighting or both as they wish. But wait, there's more. We uh, This is the only component we've shipped that's still in progress, but it's at least at the 80% level. Uh, Effie Laka and uh, Thanos Malamos uh, from Crete have integrated W3C's web audio API. This is 
is really high fidelity sound, the ability to put together synthesis chains and many other things, uh, but spatialized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm kind of thinking our, our unofficial working group slogan should be, but wait, there's more because the list just keeps going on. The, the reason it's big is because we work well, we strive to play well with others. We work with primarily ISO, also Kronos and OGC. We make sure we don't go off the reservation there. And uh, in the slides, you can track our lineage. How did we get here? Where did we get here from this? And I got to tell you, it's been five years. Uh, uh, when we, one of our most influential workshops was with W3C on AR and VR. That's just today coming to maturity in the WebXR API standard. Uh, in 2017, you can see Roy Walmsley uh, at the far right uh, talking about what's our X3D4 design? Where can we go? What should we do? We continued in the 2018 conference on how we keep going forward. 2019, we put out our initial draft that said, okay, experts, kick hard. What else is missing? What do we got to fit? Here we are today. That uh, screenshot on the right is from about, let's see, 90 minutes ago uh, of all of you. And uh, I'm counting 25 participants right now. I think we topped out at about 36. Uh, we're going to be reprising some of this for the SIGGRAPH conference in the coming weeks. But wait, there's more. We've set a uh, high bar in November, the annual Web3D conference. Uh, we had to cancel because of uh, abundance of caution. We perhaps the first SIGGRAPH conference to uh, delay and postpone. We will be online. We will be the week before SIGGRAPH Asia. We do have people telling us, I'm writing that paper. I want to do that tutorial. I expect this will We'll let Web, Web3D Web members decide, consortium members decide. But I suspect that there will be no blockers or if there are anything not ready, sorry, you're not going to ISO. That's our, our target right now. Wow, that was at least 83 things. How do you track all this stuff? Well, um, our strategy is up there, but our work is primarily visible publicly. It's just that there's a lot of it. so. If you want to know the details, track our, our weekly meeting minutes, track the discussions on the public list. If you want to know the announcements of the, of the major events, okay, watch Twitter. Um, here's our release on there. You just saw that a minute ago. We've, our, our next round of working group activity is to refresh every one of these things. They're already pretty closely up to date, but just that act. Make sure we don't overlook anybody. We do have 4,000 models and growing. But how do we test all this stuff? I peeked back at our YouTube channel uh, the other day. Boy, that's coming right along. And you can see there's a lot of activity there. We actually have a handful of videos in the queue right now going to get pushed up. Uh, this week's events will be interesting. Multiple players, x 3 Xite, and x 3 dom I can't stress enough that we, we take not one implementation, but two. You must have two independent implementations to ensure that the spec is correct, to make sure that anybody can understand it and there's not some hidden secret independency on there. So those two are in JavaScript. We have two more that are tracking right along, Castle Game Engine and Free World. And we, uh, or further turning our sites to uh, the authoring tools again, now that we have this stable definition. Uh, we have active work in Blender, updating that. I expect more work will happen with MeshLab. Uh, really interesting outcome from that x 3 Unified Object Model work is, oh, we are auto-generating code bases. Right now, the Java and Python and Turtle for the ontology, totally mature. They track x 3 d 4 exactly as the working group makes every little refinement. John Carlson is working on a Node.js version, not manually. He takes his code patterns and he's now auto-generating them. 
We've added JSON encoding. That was last year's achievement. We're, we're going ahead and I'm about to push a, I think we're a week away. The X3D validator has been at version three for a while, but we've got it working locally now on machines here in Monterey. We're gonna go forward with that. Uh, boy, how do you keep track of it? Well, you can look at this diagram and say, hey, working group, Stay in the, keep it all hanging together. We're right in the middle here now. We are updating all of these things, the architecture, the HTML relationships, XML and Vermal simultaneously. All the other things are mostly flowing from that and rippling out automatically. I expect next year we'll plow through the rest of them. Okay, so there's more stuff here. Somebody's interested in something that we don't have time for. You could likely will find it here. What keeps us straight is our process. It's an open yet trusted process. It's based around members. It allows contributors. We don't allow any intellectual property in unless it's pre-declared as royalty-free. And indeed, uh, this is how we've stayed royalty-free and available since uh, 97. Uh, You've heard about Web3D user experience. Uh, we've told you a little bit about uh, DOM, uh, excuse me, uh, about uh, GLTF. Uh, our strategy for next year is ready. Uh, if we finish everything this year, then all of the furious activity going on in VR, AR, XR, MAR, that, that can happen next uh, week. I should note that in this this month's ISO meetings, health, safety, and security of people wearing devices is, again, coming to the forefront. Uh, British Standards Institute is proposing a new group to focus on just those characteristics. Personal perspective on printing and scanning. Well, if printing is bits into atoms and scanning is atoms into bits, have I left anything out there? Have we, is there anything we can't do? Metadata, as, as several folks have said today, remains the glue that makes sure we really can connect everything to everything. Sound, tandem, medical, our specs themselves are in version control. Every single issue besides the archive mailing list is in our issue tracker. Members have access to this as well. Wow, wow. Uh, and nobody could do this by themselves, but the group effort, the process is really important and membership has value. So I just want to thank everybody today and everybody who's not here today for so many contributions. It's awe-inspiring and uh, we're happy to continue. Please implement, evaluate, and let's push X3D4 to just part of the infrastructure. Thank you.